activate. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Jesus is saying something here that we must never forget. Religious wars are by their very nature wrong and self-defeating. Religious wars are wrong and self-defeating, no matter what religion it is. The Crusaders took up arms during the Middle Ages to advance the kingdom of God. That was their motivation. We're going to advance the kingdom of God. And so they went around and killed people. They didn't grasp what Jesus is saying here. Think about it. It was such a terrible disservice to the cause and testimony of Christ that the Crusades ever happened in the Middle Ages. It was an embarrassment to the kingdom. It was as disgusting and embarrassing to the kingdom as anything could have been. And there are an awful lot of religious leaders who have gone on to met their maker who have had to apologize or face up for that. Because it was wrong. Religious wars are wrong. You don't, you don't, you don't force your belief on someone else. You can't do that. You can't force anybody else to believe that, like a Christian. That's a choice that people make. You can't and you did. You weren't forced. Oh, I was made to go to church. Yeah, but you chose at some point either to continue or to not. You made that choice uh, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ or not. Now, certainly there was the work of Holy Spirit working in your life. That was an important part of it. But you don't force people to believe your way of thinking. You can't do it. And they were trying to do that in the Crusades, and we must never repeat that mistake in our generation, ever. On the other hand, you have Islamists who are battling to establish religious rule, and they are equally wrong. You can't force religious rule. You can't force religious law on people and expect them to believe it and embrace it. You can't change people's behavior until you change their heart. Forcing morality does not change people. We can't force morality with our laws in America. Islamists can't force morality with their changes of Sharia law. It can't happen. You change people's lives by changing their heart with truth. And Jesus is the source for that truth. We need to be very, very careful in America that we protect that. Because here's what's happening all over the world particularly with Sharia law. As Islamists move into an area, they, they demand Sharia law. Not all of them. That doesn't happen everywhere. It just happens in certain places. And they want their law to be the law of the land. And so they'll declare it Sharia zone and say, this is Sharia law. And basically what they're saying is telling the government, you have to allow us to enforce our law because that's, we have religious freedom. And so the government is pushed into a corner saying, look, by allowing it, we're actually forcing a law. We're creating law, allowing it. You see the, 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 you see the dilemma that the lawmakers get in? It's, it's now you have, we have this principle in America of, of separation of church and state. And now what, in fact, what religionists are doing, and by the way, it doesn't happen just with Islamists. We see it in, in, uh, in white supremacy also. This idea that we can force our religious law, our way of thinking, uh, on our community. Because it's a religious law and we have religious freedom. And the government says, now wait a minute. What you're doing is violating the law. And so now they've got to make a law that conflicts, that, that imposes a law on that religious community. And we have a constitution that separates religion from the law. So it's a real dilemma, it's a real problem, because it starts with people wanting to force their beliefs on other people. Religious law is a violation of God's way of doing things. It's a, it's a violation of the way Bible, the Bible sets it up. Because if you want to change people, you change their heart, and you change their heart with truth. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except for you said if you want to change, if, if lives need to be changed, they are changed by truth, not by law. Pilate doesn't grasp all of that that, that Jesus is saying. 
And he summarizes Jesus' answer this way. So Pilate said to him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You said it. You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. You see what Jesus was saying? I didn't come to force law. I didn't come to th overthrow a government. I didn't come to impose my will. I came to reveal truth. Because truth is the greatest, the greatest power in the world. I came to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Get this, Pilate. Everyone who listens to, who is of the truth, listens to my voice. You understand what I'm saying, Pilate? Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Listen to what I'm saying, Pilate. Because if you don't, you are not of the truth. You don't really want to know the truth. It's not that important to you. That is such an incredible answer that Jesus gives Pilate because it's the answer that the world needs today. If you want to know truth, listen to the source of truth. If you really want to discover truth, if you want lives to change, then seek the truth. Don't seek the law. Seek the truth. Pilate misses the point. He misses the point because as far as he was concerned, he didn't have anything to worry about. He didn't see Jesus as a threat. But more importantly, get this. He didn't think that who Jesus was was relevant. Truth wasn't relevant to him. It wasn't important to him. But look closely at Jesus' response. Here's Pilate's moment of opportunity. Jesus has come to reveal and establish truth. His kingdom is not of this world. It is of a higher order. It is not established by military might. It is established by the testimony of truth, which is greater than military might. What Jesus was saying to Pilate was, Pilate, your kingdom is what is irrelevant because it doesn't establish a relevant truth. Every political leader in the world needs to hear this message. If your political authority doesn't establish and operate by a relevant truth, it is worthless, it is useless, it will not endure. And you look at all of the political authorities through the history of the world, and we look back on all of these that have gone through, who established their, 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 their power by might. They came in and forced their beliefs and forced what they wanted and took the people by, by, by might. But they never established truth, and they didn't endure. And then Jesus says something that is extremely important about you. He says, everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. If you really want to know truth, if you are really motivated by truth, you're going to listen to me. That's what God says. Now here's one of the most critical and life-altering truths that you need to know. How is the kingdom of God advanced on the earth? Jesus established that strategy in the last thing that he said to his disciples. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, right before he ascended into heaven. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he says, Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now I want you to see some things in this passage. First of all, Jesus says, you are to go. You are to go. You are to make disciples of all nations. All nations. I'm convinced that one of the biggest failures of the church today is that we are not out making disciples. We make disciples of our own, but we're not out really seeking the lost and revealing truth, giving them truth. Because truth changes lives. It changes lives. And baptizing him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which means 
which means following through with them as they as they embrace the truth, follow through, disciple them, get them get them growing in, in the Lord, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. This is important. Teaching them to observe all of the things that I have commanded them? No. Teaching them to observe the things that I have commanded you. Now notice what it's saying. Don't force them to obey those things. Teach them, teach them, teach them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. In other words, live by example. The way we teach people, the way we give them truth, the way we reveal that something is worth living for is by living it out in our lives. It's not a question of going out and forcing people to believe the way we believe. Not at all. But rather to live our lives, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. Let people see it in your life. That's why First Peter said, uh, that's what Peter said later. Let uh, so, uh, sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready to give a reason for the for the reason. Uh, be ready to give an answer for the reason that is in you. It's important for us to understand, as God's people, that our challenge, our goal, our destiny is to live out our faith in such a way that people observe all that He has commanded us. Not force it on them, but to live it out in their midst so they see it. And that means this. People are going to see you in a crisis, and they're going to see how you handle the crisis, and then they're going to discover, that's what I need. So instead of trying to avoid all of the crisis and problems and troubles and think that you're a bad Christian because you've had problems and issues in your life, why don't you take that as an opportunity to let people know this is how God works in my life in the middle of the crisis. Because let me tell you something, they're going through crisis also. And if they don't have an example to follow, then how can you expect them to respond accordingly? We have an incredible responsibility as God's people to go out and accomplish, do the things that God has done in our lives in the presence of the world so that they can observe all that God has commanded us. Oh, and one more thing, Christian. I am with you always to the end of the age. What is the ultimate answer for the war on terror? Here it is. Washington's not going to like this, but here it is. The ultimate answer for the war on terror is go make disciples. The church has greater power and authority to stop terrorism than our military government. God's people have greater responsibility and power to stop terrorism than the military does. By simply living out our faith and people seeing us observe all of those things that God has commanded us. Living out our faith in the world. By making disciples. By teaching people truth. Truth is the greatest power in the world today. The kingdom of God advances one soul at a time. It turns a terrorizing devil into a disciple of Jesus Christ, regardless of nationality. The war on terror will not be won with guns and bombs. It will be won with the word of God. And until we get that, until we are willing to really embrace what that means and what that does, The war of terror will advance on us. So Jesus affirms to Pilate that he is a king. He has qualified a statement enough that Pilate should not misunderstand. In the process, he has brought Pilate face to face with truth. Now the conversation has come down to a personal decision for Pilate to make. Notice again what Jesus said. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So Jesus is basically saying, Pilate, I'm testifying of the truth to you. What are you going to do with it? Pilate thought he held Jesus' destiny in his hands, but in reality, it is Pilate's destiny 
that is at stake here. That destiny depends on how Pilate responds to that truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. You see the power of what Jesus was saying? People's destiny isn't based on law. It's based on truth and how they respond to truth. Pilate responds with a very flippant, ah, what is truth? Didn't want to face it. Didn't want to face truth. So Pilate goes back out to the Jews and he says, look, I can't find any guilt there. What has he done? He, there's nothing that he's done that has broken the law. It really is a sad response on Pilate's part. How do we know that this isn't really a, uh, that this isn't really sincere on Pilate's part? How do we know that this really isn't a sincere inquiry on Pilate's part? Because when Pilate just says, ah, "What's truth?" he doesn't even wait for Jesus to answer. What's truth? And he goes out. And he says, "I don't find anything wrong with this guy." It wasn't an, a sincere inquiry. Jesus speaks of a kingdom that is established on truth, not tyranny. Pilate's response is cynical and fatalistic. Ah, what's truth? I can do whatever I want to. I'll, you know, what's truth? Truth is, is relevant to the circumstances and situation. Truth is about what's going on currently. There is no such thing as truth. By the way, our world and our society and certainly our nation is abiding by that philosophy. Uh, what is truth? And what we've held to be truth a hundred years ago is no longer considered truth. What is truth? It's relevant. And Pilate gets in the last word. He gets in the last word. He is saying what so many people say today. Nobody really knows what truth is. Truth for you may not be the same as truth for me. You'll never find this thing called truth in this messed up world that we live in. That is such an incrimination of the church today. Such an incrimination of the world today. I had a, an interesting experience this week. I got asked to go do a commercial down at the studio downtown and to voice this commercial uh, for an upcoming event in Kansas City. And I'd never worked with this, this client before. I had worked at the studio many, many times. And so I was real friends with the, with the engineer, but it was a new client. So I went in and uh, went through the process. Hi, how are you? And so forth and so on. And, and they gave me the copy. This is what we want. And they said, uh, uh, here's, 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 here's what we need to accomplish. But here's what. We don't want to tell you how to, how to interpret this copy. We want you to do whatever you want with the copy. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, then we'll adjust. But we'd really like to see, since this is the first time you've seen the copy, and we're assuming that people, when they hear this commercial, it will be the first time they've heard the commercial, or maybe second or third. But it will be fresh to them. And we want to know what they get out of it. What do you get out of it? So, so just interpret it, and you do it your way. Uh, OK. So I can tell you right now, the copy's too long. They wanted it in 60 seconds, and it was coming in at about 70 seconds. So, doesn't matter, they said, we don't care. Just, just interpret it and do it the way you want. So I just had fun with it. I just went in and gave it to him the way he want. And the guy just throws his hands up and he says, that's it, that's it. And I was like, I'm pretty slug. <laughs> uh, but we spent a little more time, we took a few things, got some things done, and they used the original, the original reef. I left. And as I was driving away, uh, that, or as I was almost home, my phone rang, and it was the engineer. And he says, you're not going to believe what they said about you after you're gone. <laughs> and I got to thinking about that when I was studying this lesson. What are people going to say about you when you're gone, when you're not there? Are they going to say, he was a standard of truth? What are they going to say? What a great guy. Or are they going to say, what a doofus? What are they going to say about you after you're gone? I'll tell you what I want people to say about me. 
he lived the truth. That's what I want. He lived the truth. Do I live it all the time? No. I know you find that hard to believe, but just ask Marsha. <laughs> but I want that for my life. That's what I really want. That underlying foundation for my life is to live the truth. I want people to see truth in my life and to either embrace it or reject it because it is truth. Not because they like me. Not because I'm so pretty. Not because I've, I've, I've done something that they thought was cool. But because I'm living truth. What are people going to say about you when you're gone? On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a